We're going to close out the um, mysticism and the humanities special topics this evening uh, with a concentrated focus on uh, an expansion of Jung's idea of active imagination, which I imagine is something that most, many, most of you are familiar with. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to marry Jung's concept of active imagination to um, what a scholar of comparative mysticism refers to as empowerment or the empowered imagination. And we're gonna look at ways that he uh, developed that. And then Jeff Kripal further develops that in some of his work as well. So that's hence the, hence the awkward phrase of empowered active imagination. And then we're gonna apply that um, to a couple different examples um, in the field of comparative mysticism. And then we're gonna close with um, Jung's recently published lectures uh, on Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. A uh, very sexy topic for a Wednesday evening. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, I want to make sure. Is there a bar across the top of the screen? No? Okay, good. Okay, so here's, um, here's an overview of our evening. We're going to start with this notion of the empowered imagination, which, as I mentioned, is a, a sort of a, a hybridization of two different terms or two different concepts that will create a third. Um, then we're going to take a look at Jung's notion of active imagination. Um, for those of you that had the Jungian psychology class, is this something that you covered in that class? Um, I, I can only see four people right now, by the way. So, um, one of them is Charlotte. Charlotte, did you guys get into? Uh, get you folks get into active imagination? We got into it a little bit. Yeah, I suspect that the second years maybe a little more, but um, we got into it definitely. Great, thanks. Um, okay, thank you, Rachel. And then the third part, um, we're going to look at Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. Um, and, and I'll do like an introduction of that in a minute. But the reason why um, I, I got kind of excited and like, why am I doing this versus tens of thousands of other things that we could do um, is because Jung's lectures, um, the, the, the Philemon Foundation, uh, which is a nonprofit um, out of London, uh, headed by board of directors and um, Sonu Shamdasani is the, has been a big part of that. They've been publishing a lot, a lot, a lot of Jung's previously unpublished work over the last, pretty much since the Red Book. So for the last 15 years or so. Um, and part of that publication process is they've been publishing lectures that Jung did um, at the ETH, which is the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And they've been publishing them not in order. So like volumes like one and two came out and then they just published volume six and seven over the past few years. But what the volumes show is Jung as a comparative psychologist of religion, which is personally what has me interested in these, in these later volumes. So there was a volume on yoga and meditation that came out um, two years ago. And then just this past January, um, Jung's lectures on the spiritual exercises. And what makes this volume particularly interesting is that Jung doesn't really go into depth um, in really in, in the spiritual exercises or in much of Christian mysticism. You know, Jung is more in the, in the realm of Gnosticism and alchemy and the psychological commentaries that he wrote to a number of Eastern texts, um, his writings on Christian theology, but he doesn't really delve into specific um, mystics, specifically Christian mystics or mystical texts. So it makes his lectures on the spiritual exercises kind of unique in that for the first time in the history of Jung's studies, we now have like a 300 some page volume specifically devoted to, to one topic in the realm of Christian mysticism. So that's what um, got me interested. And then we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later this evening. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the imaginal. Um, and this notion of a genealogy of imaginal experience is something that I'm summarizing and borrowing from Jeff Kripal's book, Secret Body, which came out, um, I think in 20, 2018 or 2019. Um, and Kripal does a really, um, really nice job of tracing this, uh, the history of this notion of the imaginal 
um, pretty much over the past hundred years of scholarship. Um, he starts with the psychical research tradition, um, which is um, the, the British Society for Psychical Research, uh, and then later the American Society for Psychical Research, which was a turn of the century, uh, 19th, early 20th century uh, group of um, scholars, uh, I, I believe oh, many whom were oriented around Cambridge, um, who were very interested in paranormal phenomena and paranormal investigations. They were basically like an academic group of ghostbusters um, with like very high research standards. Um, and they, you know, some, some of them for decades would, would, would uh, interview and rigorously uh, not try to debunk, but rigorously investigate certain mediums. They would attend seances. Um, they would interview people that had uh, encounters with dead loved ones. Um, and one of these, one of the most prominent figures was um, Frederick Myers. And Frederick Myers actually coins the term uh, imaginal in our, in a sort of, at least in the, in the sort of common English usage. And he has this very interesting uh, evolutionary understanding of the notion of the imaginal. Um, he uses it in, in the, the, the sort of frame of an insect's metamorphosis so that the, the imaginal stage would be the final stage of the fully formed post-larval insect. It's kind of a, it's a very interesting kind of, a, well, evolutionary model based on a Darwinian sort of thing here. But the imaginal stage was the result. It was the final result or the product of a ripening or a fruition process. And I think this is very important from a Jungian perspective because Jung always interpreted image as, as a result or arising out of affect or instinct, right? He has that very famous spectrum where on one end we have instinct and on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have the archetype or the image. So for Jung, the origins and the roots of image uh, is, is somatic, it's in the body. Um, and it's actually deeply embedded in the nervous system. So there's this connection between the imaginal and this sort of evolutionary, almost like bio, biophysical kind of process, right? So then of course, when we get to Jung, um, Jung was aware of the writings of psychical research tradition. I'm not sure Jung would have picked up on, on Meyer's use of the term imaginal, but Jung comes up with something very different uh, that he termed active imagination. And this is a process that came for him uh, out of what he called his confrontation with the unconscious, which is the title of a famous chapter in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which outlines um, his deep descent into the unconscious, into the underworld that we now uh, have marvelously illustrated in the Red Book, as well as the Black Books, which were recently published a few years ago, um, also through the work of the Philemon Foundation. So I'm gonna come back to active imagination later um, in a little bit more depth. So. The next major figure um, that, that Kripal highlights is Henri Corbin, who was a scholar of comparative mysticism, um, specifically uh, Islamic Sufism and the work of Ibn Arabi. And he wrote a very famous book called Creative Imagination um, in, in the, um, what's the subtitle? Creative Imagination uh, in, in something like in the Sufism of Ibn Arabi or something like that. Um, and Corbin, of course gets picked up by uh, a number of Jungians because Corbin was also presenting at Aronos at the same time as Jung and others. And then Corbin and Hillman also had a relationship and Hillman was highly influenced by Corbin's notion of the imaginal, which became the basis of Hillman's archetypal psychology. But the way that Corbin defined the imaginal was as a noetic organ, a noetic organ. So connected with gnosis, connected with some sort of direct experiential intuitive knowledge that has the ability to access uh, an alternate but real dimension of reality. And this is the intermediate world that Corban termed the mundus imaginalis, the mundus imaginalis, an intermediate world, an imaginal world, which for Corban is the place where myth happens. Myth, symbol, re uh, religion, religious experience, um, and as we'll see in a moment, even potentially paranormal activity, uh, visitations of deceased loved ones, 
This notion of the imaginal and more specifically a mundus imaginalis an imaginal world as an intermediary between the human sensate world, the human cognate world and some other spiritual dimension is immensely, immensely important for the comparative study of myth or religion. And that's really what I wanna focus on tonight. We're gonna basically be talking about a comparative uh, psychology of the imagination and how we can use a comparative study of imagination to uh, sort of revivify or, or expand our conversation about religion, religious experience, um, as well as the study of myth and, and um, myth and mysticism. And this is building on, you know, what we were talking about with Jeff Kripal last time, you know, that, that of all the things that has died in the humanities, the most ironic is the imagination and taking the imagination seriously and the imagination as the locus of uh, mythological and mystical experience. So Kripal does something very interesting with this notion of the imaginal. He develops it in two further ways in his secret body. The first is what he calls the empirical imaginal. So the empirical imaginal is a material manifestation of something from the imaginal realm or the mundus imaginalis. So an example of this would be uh, moments of precognition, uh, evidence of telepathy, uh, remote viewing, um, visionary dreaming that, that is accurate or predictive. So something that has a, a material or uh, we could call it concrete or this worldly phenomenon or repercussion. It's almost like information or knowledge that is drawn out of the imaginal and manifests in the material world. This is the sort of Ghostbusters aspect, right? The second piece is probably what you're gonna be more familiar with from the, the comparative mythology, comparative religion world, which is the symbolic imaginal. Symbolic imaginal is basically how we think of symbols, uh, a cipher. Right, a cipher from some other world or from some other form of mind. Um, and this is the part, uh, again, this connects to, to Corbin's notion um, of the imaginal, uh, the, the human imagination as an organ of revelation. But for Kripal, it necessitates interpretation because it's symbolic, right? Is this, is this following me so far? So one hand, we have a very material manifestation of the imaginal, and on the other hand, we have a symbolic manifestation of the imaginal, which might be revelatory experience, um, uh, a sort of image that comes to you through meditation or a, a dream image. Um, Jung called them big dreams, uh, a visionary experience where an image comes through with, with a certain amount of potency or power. Um, and then the, and, and versus, again, the empirical, which has more material historical implications. And, you know, if you have questions or, or if you want more examples or whatever, this is something we could, we could get into later. So what about this notion of empowerment? Um, empowerment is, uh, comes from this scholar, uh, Jess Hollenbach in his uh, 1996 work, which is uh, I think a aging well uh, called Mysticism, Experience, Response and Empowerment. And Hollenbach wrote this book as, a, as to offer a third alternative to the what at that time was a very kind of dry and stuck academic debate about the, the nature of mysticism and mystical experience. And the, the study of comparative mysticism was basically stuck between these two options. One, which was um, by the work of uh, uh, Boston, I think Boston University scholar named Stephen Katz, um, which was which was oriented around constructivism and folks that have third year students that have taken the uh, uh, religious studies theory method class will be familiar with these ideas. Constructivism, which basically means that all of reality, all all religion, mythic, mystical experience is constructed. Uh, it's socially constructed um, based on its context and the, the history and the time in which it emerges and which it develops. So it's a, it's a, it's a social model of, of interpreting and, and oftentimes uh, deconstructing uh, religious experience or any kind of experience. Um, the other kind of model was um, uh, oriented around notions of consciousness or pure consciousness. And this was the school that uh, Robert Foreman uh, 
um, is sort of typically associated with. So the, uh, that mysticism was what he referred to as a pure consciousness event. So we just went from something that is purely social or historical or external or contextual to a mystical experience that is purely, um, you could say, based on uh, types of consciousness or studies of consciousness or, or have some sort of um, core human phenomenological component that might be common, right? Um, a common approach across mystical experiences rather than um, something that is socially and historically determined. Does that make sense? So these can be two different polarities of looking at, at an experience, one external, the other internal. And Jess Hollenbach is saying, there's another way that we can talk about this. And it's actually from the experiences and the perspective of, of mystics themselves. So he wrote this very thick study, it's like 400 or more pages, um, around this notion of empowerment, which he applies not only to, uh, to monotheistic mystics from Christianity or Judaism or Islam, but also to paranormal experiences, um, as well as um, indigenous and Native American visionary experiences. Because what he found is that this notion of focusing on the imagination expands our hermeneutic. It expands the way that we can actually interpret these things. And it's a little bit more of a um, productive discourse than getting, getting sort of um, stuck in these academic polarizing debates about what is the nature of mystical experience. Sorry if all that was, was superfluous footnote information, but it's kind of important context for this idea of empowerment. And it's partly what makes it, I think, still exciting and important, even though it's, you know, we're 35 or whatever years later. Um, so this notion of empowerment is based upon uh, mystical practice that is based on the radical enhancement of the imagination that often emerges when the mystic tightly focuses attention by the practice of recollection. So there's a connection here between enhancement, enhancement of mental capacities, particularly the imagination, through focus and attention, right? So it's, it's, it's a very practic, practice-based uh, approach to mysticism or mystical experience but it orients around imagination. And again, we have this nod back to Corbin about the noetic possibilities of the imagination, that the imagination is more perhaps than what we think it is. And that's what Kripal does with this in a moment. So the imagination is viewed as a super sensory organ of perception, communication, knowledge. And again, this notion of a metamorphosis of the imagination, it's transformed the imagination becomes transformed through these recollective mystical practices of attention and focus and concentration so that something happens, something comes through, right? And for those of you that have a serious meditation practice, those of you, um, and sorry, those of you that have a serious meditation practice or those of you that had these types of experiences know that it, it, that it oftentimes comes through um, intensive experiences for example, and these are the two case studies that Hollenbach uses, uh, the visions of black elk, as well as the mystical ecstasy of Teresa of Avila, where in both instances, the individuals felt like some other kind of knowledge, some other kind of visionary experience, some uh, aspect of the imaginal was somehow channeling or coming through, all right? Black Elk had a series of different visions that, that brought uh, knowledge to his people about future potentialities and possibilities and renewal for his culture. Teresa of Avila's visionary experience, uh, one in particular of, of basically having a divine erotic union um, that was intimately wed to her reform uh, of the Carmelite order in the 16th century. Right. So there's very real implications of these types of experiences that were coming through uh, in this uh, imaginal capacity. Now, what Kripal does with this um, is he develops Hollenbach's notion. Um, and I love this paragraph, so I'm just going to read it if you can bear with me. But it's very alive, and I think it's very important um, because I think Kripal really gets it. And he describes the empowered imagination as special, no, special moments when the imagination is electrified, zapped, or magnetized 
and it just knows, All right? So this is, again, we're back to this notion of gnosis. Um, Dave, you're muted. I know, I'm trying to get the thing out of the way because I can't see my own slide. Thanks. Um, what is known or seen in such special states remains imagined, but it is now experienced as somehow more real and more true. The empowered religious imagination is no longer simply constructing and projecting. Right? This is the constructivist viewpoint. He's sort of he's sort of poking at Stephen Katz and, and the, the constructivist position here. It's no longer simply constructing and projecting. It is now also mediating and translating and in some quite extraordinary cases, even apparently materializing. So he's weaving in the symbolic and the empirical imaginal here. In a phrase, something is coming through and this something is both real and imagined. So Kreibel doesn't wanna reduce the imagination in the way that we often do in our contemporary culture, right? In our contemporary culture, imagination is typically seen as something that children do. It's connected to play. And the, you know, the psychoanalysts and the Jungians have kind of recovered imagination in, by calling it reverie, which is sort of a more adult form of fantasy or imagination that you can take to your, to your analyst or your therapist. But at the same, and, and that's important too, like the role of fantasy and reverie is obviously very important in psychoanalysis. But what Kreipel is talking about is, is something different here. He's talking about revelation. He's talking about when certain uh, waves of knowledge or gnosis come through the psyche that are bigger than our own um, egoic, or let's just call it small s imaginal selves. He's talking about the big S, capital I imaginal self, the way in which revelation comes through the psyche and the human imagination can serve as a channel for moments of profound revelation. For example, in the instance of Muhammad, receiving uh, revelation from the angel Gabriel, Joseph Smith, regardless of people's opinions on, on the Mormons, receiving uh, the golden tablets from the angel Moroni. There are, I mean, the history of religions is filled with these types of revelatory encounters. If you read the book of the prophets and the Hebrew scriptures, I mean, they're constantly talking to God, but they're doing it in a way that is, um, it's sort of like what Jung would call big dreams only during waking life, right? So what Kreipel is doing is coming up with a more sophisticated theory of the imagination that fits the comparative religion, comparative mysticism uh, scale. And the reason why I think he has keyed into this and why I think he gets it is because he experienced it. Uh, this is a comic book uh, section that uh, someone designed for Kripal and he included it in his uh, secret body book as an insert. Those of you that have read that book are familiar with this. Um, when Kripal was doing his doctoral research, uh, when he was a student at the University of Chicago and he was in India doing his year abroad, um, he was studying uh, Shakta Tantra in um, Bengal and in Calcutta and he was attending a um, a, a, a week long or, or multi-day puja um, for Kali. And one of those nights he had an experience where he um, was awake, but not awake, but he was awake. Um, uh, he couldn't move his body. He, it was sort of like a sleep paralysis thing, but he was, but he was conscious and he had an experience um, of basically being zapped by, um, he describes it in different ways in different contexts. Sometimes he describes it as being zapped by sort of a cosmic download divine energy. Sometimes he describes it as, as being zapped by uh, the, the Shakti, by the en energy of the goddess. Um, but he does um, also describe or, or, or uh, attribute this experience uh, to, to the, um, how does he frame it? He, he describes this experience as basically providing him with all of the knowledge that came in all of his books that he had yet to write. So it was a Gnostic transmission or a Gnostic download for him that happened through this very highly charged electric uh, sort of Kundalini like um, experience that happened to him in India as he happened to be studying uh, the subject of his dissertation, which also led to his notion in his second book, Roads of Excess, Palaces of Wisdom, that scholars of mysticism typically receive uh, their um, 
inspiration from their own mystical experiences. And he certainly had this in his own first person experience. Now, there are other instances and examples from across uh, the, the history of comparative religions and comparative mysticism where we could use this hermeneutic, this, this lens, this frame of the imaginal to, uh, to sort of expand our understanding uh, of different uh, cross-cultural comparative religious experiences. And one of those is in deity yoga practices uh, in Tibetan Tantra and Tibetan Buddhism. In deity yoga, in the creation, also known as generation stage practices, highly, highly detailed, detailed mental visualizations are created, for example, of specific deities, including their, uh, their, their clothing, their color, um, how many arms or hands, how many weapons, the different types of weapons that they might hold in their hands. Intricate, intricate mental visualizations for a number of, as part of these sadhanas or these spiritual practices. Um, oftentimes it involves imagining uh, different colors, different um, aspects of light emanating outside of the deity or um, uh, certain mystical syllables and these very complicated visualizations of syllables and uh, crescent moons and suns and different types of, of very alchemical imagery that is radiating or manifesting or, or bathing the practitioner in light. Now, what happens when these types of uh, visualizations and practices, when, when the practitioner is so focused on these visualizations that they actually come alive and actually begin to sort of do their work on the practitioner. At some point, the practitioner stops visualizing and becomes visualized, right? So there's a moment where there's a shift in agency. It's not the ego doing the practice, it's the practice being done to the practitioner, right? And that's this notion of empowerment, that it's through these types of highly, highly focused, concentrated spiritual practices that the, the imagination becomes empowered and sometimes becomes alive and then takes on an agency of its own. Right? And another example we have here from the Sufi Islamic world um, is from Ibn Arabi, who is probably the greatest uh, Sufi philosopher, mystic, and saint, but also certainly one of the greatest theorists of the imagination and the originator of this notion of the imaginal um, and this notion of the alam al-mital the alam al-mital, which translates as the realm of images or the imaginal world. Right? And this is where Corban uh, received his inspiration for this notion of the mundus imaginalis. With Ibn Arabi, we have multiple levels of imagination, multiple levels of imagination, one of which we could consider to be this idea of an empowered imagination, right? where there is this sort of in-between, in-between, where the angels and the, de the angels and the divinity can come through so that the human can receive the message, wake up, That's, this is sort of the Gnostic transmission, right? So there's lots of comparative material uh, throughout the history of religions, throughout comparative mysticism, that we can continue to um, elaborate and expand this idea of, a, of an imaginal hermeneutic, excuse me, or hermeneutic of the imagination, all right? You can probably see where I'm going here, right? When we turn to look at Jung and his notion of the of active imagination, when we build, when we look at Jung's active imagination through this lens of the imaginal, his Red Book experience takes on a whole nother life of its own, because what we see in the Red Book is that the imaginal figures come to life. Initially, Jung is trying to dialogue with them and, and, and Jung is sort of really ambivalent about what their actual nature is. But at one very important moment, early on, relatively early on in the Red Book, Elijah, who everybody here I think is, is familiar and has read the Red Book at this time. So um, you should be familiar with this, the, back, the background and dates and all this. And one very important point, Elijah slash Philemon says, we are real. We are real and not symbols. So we are no longer in the realm of just sort of semiotics or just interpretation or hermeneutics. We are now in the realm of ontology, 
where the imaginal realm has its own agency and the figures that populate the imaginal realm have their own agency, right? Elijah, who later transforms into Philemon, Salome, who later trans in, transforms into the serpent and Jung's soul, they take on a life of their own and they become the ones who direct the scenes. But even more than that, they become the ones that Jung turns to, to grant him knowledge. They grant him knowledge. This is gnosis, right? This is the definition of gnosis. It is knowledge that is coming from outside Jung through these imaginal figures that somehow simultaneously exist within his psyche and yet also without, right? So we are in the world of the mundus imaginalis here. We are in this sort of transitional space in between the human and the more than human, right? And it's the imaginal realm, it's the mundus imaginalis or the empowered imagination that translates and sort of transfers um, these empowered imaginal figures, right? And then this later quote by Elijah, we are just as real as your fellow men. You solve nothing by calling us symbols. How is this possible? How can these, uh, I mean, they're, they're, Jung initially understood them as personifications of the unconscious, right? But if they were simply that, how would they contain uh, such imagine such knowledge that was being transferred through his imagination that would ultimately be salvific for Jung, right? So there's this sort of soteriological uh, aspect of the Red Book where Jung is in a sense being saved by these figures that have the knowledge that he seeks. Now we know that it's alchemy that brings Jung out of the Red Book, uh, this, the confrontation with the unconscious uh, sort of age or, or, or stage of his, of his life. Um, Jung states in the epilogue to the Red Book that he worked on, this Red, on, worked on the Red Book for 16 years. But it was when he became introduced to alchemy, specifically Chinese alchemy, through the secret of the golden flower, that he finds a way out. And what he means by that is he finds the way out of himself and of his own inner process. So alchemy sort of regrounds him or reorients him back into the material world. And what Jung finds in the secret of the golden flower is a form of active imagination that I think resonated with his own experience in the Red Book, right? So this is the beginnings of this notion of a comparative psychology of the imagination. I mean, a comparative psychology of the imagination that we can build upon from Jung's notion of active imagination. And, and he starts to connect to, for example, uh, Taoist alchemical uh, visualizations and imaginal practices, um, as well as through the work of his own uh, psychotherapy practice with his clients uh, this, and his patients. And I got a lot of material on this and I don't wanna um, just, taking a look at the time here, we're already pretty far in. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in this, you can read this section of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. It's very fascinating. This is basically where Jung states, he, he didn't really know, he didn't have a technique because he was so steeped in, let's just call it more reductive forms of psychoanalysis. So he had no technique where he could get to the bottom of his own inner processes to find the images which were concealed in the emotions. I love that line. The images which were concealed in the emotions. Again, so this is the somatic, uh, you could call it the, the, uh, the somatic origination um, of the archetype or the imaginal, right? So finally, he lets himself drop. That's the famous phrase from this section of, of MDR. I let myself drop. And when he lets himself drop, in other words, when he lets go of sort of cognitive, analytical, reductive thinking, he can drop into the imaginal. And this is when he has his first active imagination. He enters into the cave. He sees the youth with blonde hair, uh, the blood, the scarab, the red sun. Um, and then the whole Red Book uh, journey starts to unfold, okay? Um, and again, we can, we can get back into some of this stuff um, later. Um, again, I don't wanna overwhelm you with, with too much 
stuff here. I, I, I realize the fire hose is, is true to true to mythological studies fashion. The the fire hose is on. I'm going to try to try to t taper it a little bit, but um, there's a lot of material here. So um, Jung in 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 1920s, a, a young American woman named Christiana Morgan came to Jung for analysis, and she was very very creative and very very gifted. Um, and Jung uh, instructs her in how to do active imagination. And this is a very, very interesting section here. He says, use, only use the retina of the eye at first. This is very interesting. It's very physical for something that we think of as entirely internal. Only use the retina of the eye in order to objectify. Then instead of keeping on trying to force the image out, you just want to look in. When you see these images, you want to hold them and see where they take you, how they change. This is a very passive approach. It's passive, but it's also focused. It's disciplined. You want to try to get into the picture yourself to become one of the actors. Interesting, he has like a, the like a, um, a theatrical kind of notion here. Become one of the actors. When I first began to do this, I saw landscapes. Then I learned how to put myself into the landscapes and the figures would talk to me and I would answer them. Now, typically the, we would think that this was crazy, right? A person doing this sort of thing was crazy. They're talking to their own um, interior figures. They're having their own imaginal puppet show. But, you know, for Jung, the figures, because of the lessons that he learned from them, they were alive. The figures not only had uh, personalities, they also had agency. They also had agency, right? They are more than dreams because they represent the mixing and fusing of conscious with the unconscious, right? Very interesting, very interesting. So I just wanted to um, include this because not a lot of people are, are reading, you know, the Christiana Morgan, the visions seminars there. So Jung ends up doing, um, a whole series of seminars over four years on, on the, the images that Christiana Morgan produces. Um, and they're published as interpretation of visions. And the, the artwork that she produced or the images that she produced are very, very, very similar um, it's stylistically to what we see in Jung's Red Book. Um, so that's something that I would just encourage you. This is a very interesting um, chapter in the history of the early days of what becomes Jungian psychoanalysis. Um, but very central. Part three, and this is the grand finale, I swear. So, um, before uh, Jung did a series of lectures um, at the ETH, uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, um, the, uh, the very close to the end, so I think it was his second to last series, um, he focused on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. I already kind of went over that earlier, so I won't get into that. What's so interesting, and this is like, this is like the, um, this is for the like the Jung history kind of psychobiography nerds out there. It's very interesting to me that he chooses Ignatius of Loyola and the spiritual exercises, because those of you that have read Memories, Dreams, Reflections carefully, you will remember, um, that Jung had a very, very terrifying experience with what he referred to as a sinister Jesuit when he was a child. He, me he mentions a, um, a man dressed in all black with a black frock walking down the street and he's terrified of this man. Um, and his, his father says that is a Jesuit. And it's very, it's like very serious. Um, and you know, Jung, Jung was raised in a Protestant, Swiss Reformed Protestant tradition, so it was not Catholic. So you know, a, a Jesuit priest certainly would have been an outsider. But in the protocols, and the protocols are the um, unedited version of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which the Philemon Foundation is hoping to publish soon. Apparently in the protocols, Jung associates the Jesuit, the, the Jung, Jung makes an association between the figure of the Jesuit and the anxiety that is produced from his childhood phallus dream. Do you remember that dream, that very famous dream that Jung has when he's, a, when he's maybe, I think he was maybe four years old, where he has this dream of this underground phallus 
and it's connected with his mother. It's very Freudian, but apparently in the protocols, he connects that dream with the Jesuit, which has led some scholars to think that there might be some sort of possible sexual abuse. Now, I don't know, but, it, but Jung's response to the Jesuit uh, as a child in memories, dreams, reflections is certainly very uh, intense um, and, and colored with anxiety. So it's interesting to me that he comes back to Ignatius of Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuits, to do these, these, um, these lectures, these conferences on, um, on the spiritual exercises you know, later in life. When he was at this point in his life, he would have been something like in his mid, mid to late 50s, or I think. Um, so that's just an interesting sort of psychobiography piece here. The, other, the context of these lectures is that they follow Jung's lectures on yoga and meditation, which were published just um, pretty much two years ago. So he does his lectures on yoga and meditation, uh, interestingly, also focusing on active imagination. And, and, and there's a big chunk in there on um, Tibetan yoga and tantric visualizations in the Tibetan tradition as a form of active imagination, right? So Jung is clearly in this realm of a comparative study of active imagination. Um, the, the challenge of reading all of these lectures is that if you're a religious studies person, it, it kind of is a little, makes you cringe a little bit because the, the, a lot of the theology and religious studies that he's basing his comparison on is very dated. So for example, he's reading a lot of early 20th century Roman Catholic theology, which is very, very dry and any, any, any uh, much theology written before the Second Vatican Council is really, really difficult to swallow. So props to Jung for reading, you know, what he was reading at the time. But then he also bases a lot of his scholarship on the Eastern Tibetan Buddhist and yoga material from Heinrich Zimmer, um, uh, Sir John Woodruff, uh, Evans Wentz, who did the translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So some of that stuff, you know, depending on where you stand on the religious studies spectrum, you might be problem might be problematic. So that's just some important scholarly context that context that Jung was basing his reading on these other scholars. Okay, who was Ignatius of Loyola? Inigo de Loyola was a 15th, 16th century um, uh, Catholic. Uh, born in the Basque region in Northern Spain. He was the youngest of 13. That's, that's a lot of children, just as an FYI. So the youngest of 13. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. I don't think many of us can. Um, he, he, was, he had a bit of a courtly life in the kingdom of Castile. And he had a very uh, fanciful, heroic kind of um, soldiering again, soldiering kind of courtly life. And he, in, the, in 1521, in the Battle of Pamplona against the French, he was wounded by a cannonball, both legs. One of his legs was broken and reset without anesthesia. All right, this dude's hardcore. That's really where I'm, where I'm going with this, right? You gotta serve, if you're the youngest of 13 and you're going into war and getting your leg broken and reset and just Give it to me now. I don't want any. I don't want any pain medicine. Like you're, you're full on, right? So I mention this because it gives you a sense of the character of Ignatius, and it also is a really important um, characterization of the Jesuit order, which was very highly, in a certain sense, militaristic in its discipline, at least in the beginning. So while Ignatius is recovering from his um, from his injuries, he's in the hospital. He he can't walk. He's in bed all day. So he starts reading um, the life of Christ and lives of the saints. And he notices, and this is what's very important. Ignatius is very psychological. He starts to notice his daydreams. He starts to pay attention to his fantasies. And he notices that after he goes in and out of certain fantasies, he has experiences either of consolation or of desolation. So this is the beginning of what people would later call Ignatian discernment. He would allow his fantasies to guide the direction of his decision-making based on how he felt after the fantasy. Uh, in, in AA, they call this playing the tape out. <laughs> if you have the desire to drink or if you have the desire to do whatever, it's like, okay, play that tape out and then, then act, right? 
So he would, um, he would fantasize about life in court. He would fantasize about chasing his beautiful ladies. And he would notice that he felt empty. He would experience feelings of desolation. But then he would fantasize about becoming this soldier or warrior for Christ. He would fantasize about um, converting to Christianity, a deeper, a deeper conversion to, his, to Christianity, and he would experience uh, these feelings of consolation. Right? So a very important part of Ignatian discernment. He ends up getting out of the hospital. He goes to a cave. Where else would you go? He doesn't go to in and out Burger. He goes to a cave for 10 months, and he has this um, very profound visionary experience that he that that Jesuits today refer to as finding God in all things. This is a very basic charism among the Jesuits, finding God in all things. It's a very worldly embodied form of mysticism. And it leads to his founding of the Jesuits in 1540, the Society of Jesus, um, where they, unlike the, uh, the cloistered monks or unlike the Franciscans or unlike other types of religious orders, they decide that they are going to be contemplatives in action and live a mixed life where they're going to take very seriously deep interior prayer, but also um, education, acts of charity, works of service. So uh, again, I got I have a little too much info here, but um, basically the spiritual exercises are designed to be presented in a number of different ways. One is as a, a 30 day, what's called the long retreat. So you do a 30 day Ignatian retreat. You can also do an eight day short retreat, or you could do what's called the 19th annotation, which is the retreat in daily life. That's, that's what I used to lead students with when I was working in campus ministry at a Jesuit college. Um, so students would come over a period of three, four, five months sometimes, and we would slowly walk through each aspect of the spiritual exercises um, with them. So the, the exercises are divided into four weeks, and then each of, the, each of the meditations, the imaginal exercises, are divided up by days. So, for example, week two would be meditations on different schemes from the life of Christ. Uh, week three... Each day would be a different scene from Christ's passion or death. And then week four um, had a number of different kinds of uh, meditations, visualizations, or imagination. Um, one of which is called the meditation um, on the love of God. And I just wanted to read that because it gives you a sense of the use of the imagination in the spiritual exercises are entirely based on the imagination and using the imagination to very, very concretely and viscerally uh, place yourself into scenes from the life of Christ, whether it's the birth of Christ, he asks you to describe being in the manger, smelling the smells of the animals, like, you know, which was probably not great, um, or being at the foot of the cross during, you know, Christ's death, et cetera, et cetera. But this meditation on the love of God is very, it's very, very beautiful. And this, this is sort of this idea of finding God in all things. So this is, this is how it's written. Um, I will call into my memory the gifts I have received, my creation, redemption, and other gifts particular to myself. I will ponder with deep affection how much God has done for me and how much God has given me of what God possesses, and constantly how God desires to give me even God's very self in accordance with his divine design. Apologies for the male language. So the notion is, it's basically a gratitude, what we would call today like a, like a gratitude meditation or like, like journaling on, on gratitude, like call to mind all the things that I've received in my life. Uh, and then consider how God dwells in creation in the elements, giving them existence, in the plants, giving them life, in the animals, giving them sensation, in human beings, giving them intelligence. And finally, how in the way God dwells also in myself, giving me existence, life, sensation, intelligence, and even further, making me God's temple, since I am created as a likeness and image of God's divine majesty. It's, 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 it's a meditation on the, on the reality of the work of God in all of creation. This is basically like today, like what new age folks would say about like the universe has got your back. It's like all of life is conspiring in your favor, right? 
even this stuff that might not feel so good, right? But it's this, it's this meditation on this basic and fundamental uh, trust in a higher power or in the divine working in your life. But it's entirely meditative, right? And imaginal. And the idea is when you go on retreat, you're just focusing, again, this is the recollection piece, you know, the, the, the notion of empowerment with Jess Hollenbeck. Um, when you are in this space of intense concentration and recollection, for those of you that have been on retreat or a long retreat, you know, when you focus on this stuff, even if it's just three days or eight days, much less 30 days, when this is all you're doing for 30 days, stuff comes alive, stuff happens. The imaginal starts to become empowered, right? Voices, visions, dreams, things come through, right? It's a Catholic version of a vision quest. So what does Jung do with this, right? Jung looks at the spiritual exercises uh, as a form of active imagination, right? And he says very early in the first lecture, he defines the imagination as a way or means to change, improve, heal, heal, or complete the personality. The imagination become, can become a way to heal the personality through active imagination, where we attempt to generate a transformation of the human character. It's through the imagination, right? This is the Kripal thing. Not everything imagined is imaginary. There's more here than just the imagination as fantasy or making stuff up. The imagination or the imaginal has a healing component to it. I mean, this is Jungian psychology 101. It's probably brought many of you to Pacifica and to the myth program because you probably had experiences like this, right? So what Jung is doing here is he's starting to outline a comparative psychology of active imagination using different texts and traditions from East and West, right? And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so I've been going at this for almost an hour. It's a lot to take in, especially after we just had class all weekend. So let me just do, um, oh yeah, this other quote here is, is important. So where he says, um, practitioners can thus uh, from their own minds, right? This is East and West, from their own minds, produce figures that are real, right? This harkens right back to what he's saying in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, right? This is his Red Book experience. Practitioners can thus, from their own minds, produce figures that are real, even though they are, he calls them thought beings. I love this phrase, thought beings. I'd love to read the translation of what this is in German. Um, it's probably some wonderful, wonderful sounding German phrase, thought beings. Um, and um, so he's speaking from his own experience here, right? Remember what Elijah says to him in the Red Book, we are real, we are real. Right? You can produce, pr practitioners can produce figures that are real, even though they are thought beings. And again, not only the Red Book, but also the example from Tibetan Buddhist traditions, um, and, and also, as he's arguing here, in the spiritual exercises. So um, what else? This is Jung's description uh, of active imagination as it plays out in uh, the spiritual exercises. The whole process is practice using each individual sense, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. The aim of this enormous imaginative effort is for the meditating person to be transplanted into the situation and transformed through this process. The experience takes root in her as if it were her own story. She transforms herself directly into the situation through such contemplation. Right? It's through the creative, imaginative power of the meditator, right? Empowered imagination again. The creative, imaginative power of the meditator that makes the situation as real as possible. Whether you are practicing um, very intricate, extensive Tibetan Buddhist sadhanas, whether you're practicing the spiritual exercises, whether you, whether you are simply just uh, out in nature, allowing yourself to, to open yourself up to the creative beauty of the wilderness around you, right? These are all moments to transform our own consciousness through these different empowered imaginal practices, right? This is the comparative psychology of active imagination, right? And Jung is formulating this very, very powerful um, 
imaginal hermeneutic of how we can look at comparative religion, comparative mysticism, right, through the lens of the imaginal. All right, one more. I know I'm like, I know I'm, well, all right, we're almost there. I don't want to keep talking. Just a few final quotes here. This, um, I think this really is a good summary quote from um, his lectures. The most intimate merging, and this is in the context of uh, Ignatius of Loyola, the most intimate merging of the life of Christ with the life of the individual naturally takes place. Uh, an image held up to us to remind us of our true nature, right? So this is the purpose of the spiritual exercises. This is the telos, right? Then an intimate merging of the archetype with the individual. That's another way to frame this, right? A merging of the archetype with the individual. For those of you that have read Edward Edinger's uh, Ego and Archetype, this is gonna make a lot of sense to you, right? The ego self access, the connection, the unification between the ego and the self, right? That's what he's talking about here. The deity is pictured through active imagination so vividly that one is transported into the presence of this image and ultimately absorbed into it. All right, again, think about types of yoga, for example, visualizations again, right? Virtual exercise. Through such an intimate and strenuous engagement, strenuous engagement, this is the concentration part, this is the discipline part. With this figure, the meditator's own being or soul is transferred, not transformed, but transferred into the idea and form of Christ, the archetype. You, the individual, the practitioner, becomes your own being becomes transferred into the archetype, right? Again, this is the Tibetan Buddhist piece where you, you visualize the deity, you identify with the deity, and then you dissolve the deity. So you ultimately end up in nothingness or emptiness, but there is a moment of union and unification, right? That's the difference in the Tibetan practices between the generation stage and the completion stage. In the generation stage, you visualize the deity. In the completion stage, you dissolve the deity, right? So, you, so there's, not, uh, there's not a fusion. There's a, there's a union, a unification, a transformation of the personality, and then there's a complete letting go, right? So it's both. It's imagination, but then it's also emptiness. That's, the Buddhists have that down, right? Not so much in, in, in the Christian tradition, but... The Buddhists at least get that. So as a result here, to return to this quote, as a result, the human being is elevated, which is the ultimate purpose of such a meditation. So what Jung is basically talking about is that active imagination is a very, very profound process of divinization or theosis. In other words, the human being becoming divine. Right? Part of the issue is that in the Western tradition and in the Christian tradition, and, and even with Jung, there's such a aversion um, to this notion of theosis because of the fear of inflation. Right? Inflation is when the ego becomes, uh, well, inflated through contact with the numinous or contact with the archetype and it can't ground or integrate the experience. And that can lead to a type of a neurosis. Jung was very, very cautious of Westerners practicing yoga because of his fears of inflation, All right? That was Jung's greatest concern about Westerners doing spiritual practices, particularly ones outside of their traditions because they could too easily lend, lead themselves to inflation or neurosis. But in, in Buddhist practices, when you have the dissolving of the image, and the dissolving of the deity and this ultimate fundamental understanding that, that basically is atheistic, that there really is no ultimate God image because emptiness is the underlying, uh, I don't even call it, I don't metaphysical principle of reality. If you, if you ultimately end up in emptiness, uh, there's a dissolution. So uh, inflation doesn't become as much of a, I don't want to say not as much of a problem or a concern, but it's sort of like a built-in device to help uh, work with issues of inflation, um, if that makes sense. So, but the purpose here is ultimately the theosis. It's the transformation of the human being. You know, the, the, we see in the book of Genesis, ye shall become as gods, right? That's the promise in the book of Genesis, ye shall become as gods.
not in an inflationary sense, not in narcissistic sense, but because that's ultimately what the destiny of the human being is. It is this process of divinization or theosis. It's to, uh, in Jung's own words, continue the incarnation of God. All right. Why does any of this matter? Other than the fact that it might have to do with the ultimate destiny of human beings. All right. So let me conclude with this. Um, I'm really keen on this idea of revisioning, rethinking comparative religion, comparative mystical experiences through the theory or through the lens of the imagination. I think this is really important. Um, as I outlined earlier, you know, a lot of the academy and the academic jargon and debates around, you know, mysticism and who counts as a mystic and how do we interpret mystical experience? These, these things end up splitting hairs and going nowhere, in my opinion. And I think reframing and rethinking about mysticism through the lens of imagination, I think is a really rich way to move forward that is um, constructive rather than just deconstructive. The other piece here is that the implications for psychedelic research, the implications for studying altered states of consciousness, the implications for studying near-death experience, taking something like the reality of the imaginal or the mundus imaginalis, taking that notion and applying it to these types of experiences adds a whole nother layer of sophistication to what we're talking about. Much, if not most of the psychedelic research conversation right now is about like brain scans and um, uh, fMRIs and like very, very neuroscientific modes of studying altered states of consciousness. They're not talking about the imagination or the role of the imagination or the importance of the imagination or even the, the possibility of the notion of something like an imaginal in-between world where the types of entities and deities and also demons that often visit people during psychedelic uh, journeys might actually be real and have some sort of ontology or agency of their own, right? So this takes us also to this important, we are real question, right? When we look at, when we look at these types of experiences through the lens of the imagination, it brings up this important question of ontology. You know, if we take archetypes seriously, they're not just fabrications of our own egoic imagination. They come from what William James called the more. They come from another place, another realm, and they might actually have ontology and agency of their own. So if that's the case, then active imagination can take on a whole nother level of importance as a spiritual path, as a spiritual tool, as a spiritual technique, right? And we can expand active imagination even beyond Jung using the frame of someone like Ibn Arabi to really bring the transcendent piece back into Jung's notion of a transcendent function which is how he understood active imagination. Right. Another piece here is revisioning the comparative psychology of religion. So looking at Jung as a comparativist. In a, most of Jung's pu previously published works, like the collected works, particularly volume 11, which is psychology and religion, what we see in Jung's readings of Christianity and Jung's readings of Eastern texts is the comparative psychology of individuation. He's, he's uh, gleaming material from different East traditions, East and West, to bolster his own theory of individuation. But when we look at his uh, lectures from these, these Zurich seminars, particularly volumes six and seven, he's shifting towards a comparative psychology of active imagination. That seems really important to me. And it seems really important to highlight that um, in Jung, in, when we look at Jung as a comparativist. Right, so that's more of a historical sort of thing. And then the last piece is, is sort of, I've been pushing, I've, I've been on a soapbox, I'm realizing, all night. Um, this notion of the imaginal as access to the mystical, right? If you think back to what Jung's definition of mysticism is, which is encounter with an archetype, that's Jung's basic definition of mysticism. Mysticism is encounter with the archetype, right? If that's the case, then this notion of the imaginal becomes pretty key to how we access these altered states, right? It's a reframing and, a, and I think an honoring um, of the archetype in and of itself, right? That these are not just stories or these are not just you know, universal patterns or this or that. They are that, but they're also more because they're alive. 
they're alive and they're living. You know, and that was Jung's whole thing with archetypes is that they were complexes. They were something that grips us, right? To be gripped by the archetype. And then the final place is, you know, if we really want to take the imaginal seriously or this, or this notion of an abundance imaginal seriously, we can look at it as where altered states of consciousness occur, where religion happens, where mysticism happens in the imaginal, through the imaginal. This brings me to my favorite thing from Patrick's book, his notion of imaginal prayer. I love this idea, Patrick. I have told you this before. I love this idea of imaginal prayer. And if we take the Munus Imaginals seriously, I think it even deepens uh, Patrick's notion here of the profound, profound implications uh, of, of this notion of imaginal prayer, that, if, if, that where our prayer comes from and what can come through our prayer, right? What can come through our prayer if we have this notion of the imaginal in mind, right? And I can go on and on and on, but I'm not. I'm going to stop. And now we have at least about 20 minutes. And let me, before I end, I got I to gotta do my little, hey, boo, look at Ignatius. He's just, he's looking right at you. And he's just like, yeah, look at my book. Check out my spiritual exercises. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.